My name is Sanjay Gupta, I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Today I wanted to talk to you about chest pain, and in particular I wanted to talk to you about a patient who came to see me, um, which inspired this video. So more recently I came across a gentleman who was about 50 years old, and he had started experiencing chest pain. And as anyone who experiences chest pain should do, he went to his doctor, the doctor sent him to the cardiologist, and the cardiologist did all the tests. So they put him on a treadmill, he did okay on the treadmill, uh, but because he was continuing, and the treadmill was normal, right? So he, but he continued to complain of chest pains. And because he was continuing to complain of chest pains, the cardiologist did this thing called an angiogram where you actually go in and look and visualize the heart arteries to try and identify whether there may be a narrowing. No test is 100%, so even though the treadmill was normal, because he was continuing to get the chest discomfort, the cardiologist decided to do the angiogram. This is what I would do. But the angiogram came back clear, so the angiogram did not show any significant heart artery narrowing. So the consultant turned around to the patient and said, look, you know, you're fine. There's nothing dangerous going on. We've not really picked up a heart issue here, so don't worry about it and go away. Whilst this was reassuring for the patient, the problem was that the patient continued to experience chest discomfort. And this is one of the problems that as doctors, we often are interested in something because it may be something we deal with. But once we've excluded that thing, and in particular, if, if, if we've excluded something dangerous, we then just discharge the patient. What we don't realize is how uncomfortable and disabling symptoms of chest pain can be. So even though they're not dangerous, they can still adversely impact on a person's quality of life. And this patient came to me and he said, look, you know, there are times when this pain is so bad that I want to kill myself. And this was terrible, you know. So I thought I would do a video on what else could it be if it's not your heart. If you've gone through the tests and despite that and the, uh, and the tests have come back normal and your doctor says it's not your heart, what else could be the cause of the chest pain? So the first thing to say is that pain, pain can occur from any of the structures in the chest and there are lots of structures including the heart, the lungs, the muscles, uh, the spine, etc. That's the first thing. So pain can come from anywhere. The second thing to say is that with, when it comes to the heart, the reason we get chest pain is because of a lack of blood getting through to the heart muscle. The heart muscle starts suffocating because it's not getting the blood and therefore it aches. The tests we do are largely looking at the big blood vessels and seeing whether those blood vessels are obstructed in any way, which is why the blood is not getting through, which could be the mechanism by which the patient gets the chest pain. However, it is important to understand this, that the test we do have a limited resolution. So when you're looking at the heart arteries, you're not looking at all the heart arteries. You're looking at the big heart arteries. And it's important to look at the big heart arteries because if the big heart arteries were blocked, then if they blocked off completely, a large part of the heart muscle would go without blood and that heart muscle could get damaged. However, it is also possible that you may have disease in the smaller blood vessels. And because the blood can get through the bigger blood vessels, but it doesn't go through the smaller blood vessels, that can still cause pain. This condition is called microvascular angina. It's a very difficult condition to diagnose because there are no real good tests that tell us whether someone has microvascular angina. The good news is there are some centers now that are developing certain tests. One of them is called an acetylcholine challenge test, which can look for this thing. So yes, it can still be the heart, even though the heart tests have come back normal. The good news is because it's the smaller vessels, they don't carry the same kind of um, level of dangerousness as if you have a big blood vessel that is narrowed. However, microvascular angina can also be very debilitating. And really, if it is indeed microvascular angina, then the only way at this point in time until we get these acetylcholine challenge tests available all over the country, until that it is largely a clinical diagnosis and uh, a therapeutic trial of medication can sometimes make a big difference. In terms of medications, what can you use? You can use nitrolingual spray, so nitrolingual spray, which is like the spray in the, uh, in, uh, under the tongue that is given for normal angina, 
can open up the tiny blood vessels as well and that may provide the patient with relief and if a patient came to me and says oh as soon as I take the spray it helps and I know that their big arteries are okay then I would be thinking microvascular angina so that's one possibility of chest pain that could be coming from the heart which is uh, which may not be picked up on the normal tests the second possibility is something called coronary artery spasm so in coronary artery spasm what can happen is that the blood vessels are okay but for whatever reason they go into spasm and because they go into spasm they um, form a transient narrowing through which blood cannot get to the heart muscle and therefore the heart muscle starts screaming for more blood the patient gets pain and when the coronary artery spasm is released the pain goes away however when as doctors we go and have a look the heart artery looks fine so we think the heart arteries are open and therefore there's no good reason why the patient should be getting angina but coronary artery spasm is a real problem and can be quite difficult to diagnose again in patients with coronary artery spasm pending you know there are no really good tests at the moment which absolutely confirm that diagnosis but trying some medications for the heart can sometimes work. A few things about coronary artery spasm. Number one, beta blockers tend to make coronary artery spasm worse, whereas beta blockers are often given for patients who have traditional angina, but in coronary artery spasm, beta blockers can make it worse. However, taking again, nitrolingual spray, oral nitrates, or even calcium blockers like diltiazem can sometimes relieve coronary artery spasm and that may be another way of determining whether the symptoms you're getting are due to the coronary artery spasm if a therapeutic trial of medications addresses the problem. Another place that pain can come from is from the sac in which the heart sits. This is called the pericardium. So the pericardium can sometimes get inflamed and that can cause discomfort in the chest. However, that discomfort is very different to the discomfort that you would experience from angina. In angina, microvascular angina, coronary artery spasm, or even macrovascular angina, the symptoms are like someone sitting on your chest, like an elephant sitting on your chest. Very tight, very, you know, you cannot localize it to one spot. In things like pericarditis, this inflammation of the pericardium, the discomfort is sharper, it's worse on breathing in, it tends to change with position and often patients find that the discomfort gets better when they sit forward. It's generally more localized, it's not generalized, and it's much sharper. So that's another possible cardiac cause of chest discomfort, which is not dangerous, but can be very debilitating and may not be picked up on traditional heart tests. It's also worth understanding that even though it may not be the heart, there are other structures within the chest which can also cause discomfort. And sometimes that discomfort can be indistinguishable from heart discomfort, from angina. In particular, we have the gastrointestinal tract, we have the esophagus, we have the stomach, we have the gastroesophageal um, junction. And so things like reflux disease can cause very uncomfortable discomfort. The way you suspect it is usually if there's a relationship with food and that can uh, present as a burning discomfort but may also present as a heaviness. Uh, the interesting thing is that reflux disease also gets worse with exercise, a little bit like angina sometimes. And so sometimes it can be, you know, indistinguishable from angina. Yeah. The second thing is sometimes you can get something called esophageal spasm, like you get coronary spasm, you can get esophageal spasm. Now that's a very difficult diagnosis to make because again, when you have anything where you suspect a gastric cause, the doctor will just look into the stomach and see how things are and he's looking for inflammation but if you get uh, esophageal spasm that can not be there when the doctor is looking with his endoscope and therefore it can be missed but again esophageal spasm can be this tight knot like sensation in the esophagus which can come on of its own accord and can be incredibly uncomfortable with esophageal spasm i understand that sometimes drinking a couple of glasses of cold water can suddenly can help relieve the spasm so that's just an interesting thing the other thing of course is ulcers or uh, gastritis can also cause discomfort which may manifest as a heaviness etc it's also worth noting that gastric uh, or esophageal pathology can also respond to nitrolingual spray usually angina or heart pains get better after about a minute of taking the spray 
but with esophageal pains and gastric pains, it can take up to 10 or 15 minutes. So the, just the fact that it responds to the nitrolingual spray doesn't automatically mean it's not gastric. It can be gastric, but typically it takes a lot longer for it to respond to nitrolingual spray. In women, particularly older women, the possibility of gallstones, gallstones can also cause discomfort in their chest. So, you know, when I'm faced with a patient, of course, there is the possibility it could be the heart, the microvascular angina, the coronary spasm. But the next thing I would always look for is the stomach. And I would always investigate the stomach with an endoscopy. I would ask a gastroenterologist. And particularly in women, but also in men sometimes, I would do an ultrasound of the um, gallbladder just to make sure it's not a manifestation of gallstones. And that can sometimes mimic cardiac chest pain. What else could it be? It could also be the lungs. We have the lungs. So clots chronic clots in the lung can cause chest pain. Usually those pain, the pain caused by clots tends to be more sharp rather than the dull uh, discomfort. When it's the lungs, it can be associated with cough. It can be associated with uh, breathlessness. Chest infections can also cause discomfort. Pleurisy can be very, very painful. And the other thing that can sometimes cause pain from the lungs is a small pneumothoraxes, so pneumothoraces, so a little hole in the lung can sometimes cause pain, uh, but that's generally unusual and certainly would be very unusual to have it on a recurrent basis. But if it comes out of the blue, no one's actually done a chest x-ray, they may miss a pneumothorax that could cause the pain. So again, I think in that patient who has normal heart investigations, we don't think it's their heart, we don't think it's their stomach, the next step is to look at their lungs and especially at least do a chest x-ray or maybe do a scan of the lungs. What else could it be? It could also be musculoskeletal pain. So we have muscles, we have bone here and often um, inflammation of the muscles, inflammation of the bone can cause pain. Typically this discomfort tends to be quite localized. It tends to be quite sharp. And one of the things that makes me think of musculoskeletal pain is that if I press, I'm able to reproduce the pain. That is the hallmark for me of musculoskeletal pain. Often people are very quick to rush in and say, oh, it's definitely musculoskeletal. It's not your heart, it's musculoskeletal. It may not be, but if you had pain and the pain was uh, palpable and on, uh, uh, you know, the, you could bring it on by pressing uh, and it was localized, then simple painkillers can sometimes help and may take that away. Finally, I think anxiety and stress can cause chest discomfort, and this is commonly overlooked. So, you know, anxiety and stress are ubiquitous. Everywhere we look, people are stressed. And one of the manifestations of stress can be a discomfort in the chest, often at times of stress, often accompanied with a feeling of fear, often accompanied with a uh, heart rate going up. But that's another thing. And if all the other causes have been excluded, then you know addressing stress and anxiety levels may be all that is needed. One other thing I would say is in those people where nothing is found, you know, so everyone has looked for everything and they're still getting the chest pain, and in particular the guy I was talking about who came to see me, sometimes there is little merit in trying to go further and try and find the cause of the pain because when you've done that level of investigation, you would have picked up something dangerous. So in that setting, the better thing is to try and control the patient's pain and say, okay, well, we don't know where this pain is coming from, but we can be confident that we've investigated you comprehensively. Let's just forget about looking for an underlying cause because we've done all these tests and we don't want to spend another five years of your life looking for more things whilst you're suffering. Let's just try and control your pain. In that setting, there are these clinics set up in different parts of the country called refractory angina clinics or chest, uh, recurrent chest pain clinics, which can be extremely useful. I tend to send my patients to a clinic in Bradford Hospital, which is exceptional because they look at the whole patient and they educate the patient and they make the patient more capable of managing their pain. And as the person feels more empowered and can manage the pain a lot better, his quality of life improves. Those are just a few tips. If you're someone who is continuously getting chest pain, no one's ever been found, no one's really found a diagnosis, you're still struggling and you're still worried that, you know, is the pain dangerous? It is worth thinking of all these other possibilities and maybe asking your doctor to send you to a clinic such as a refractory angina or a recurrent chest pain clinic where they can just concentrate on controlling your pain 
uh, and allowing you to manage your pain a lot better, which can actually result in complete resolution of symptoms over a period of time. So I hope you found this useful. Please uh, let me know what you thought of this video. If you think anyone may benefit, please consider sharing this video. And once again, thank you for all that you do for me.